Shalom, and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamud in Highland Park, New Jersey, at the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Shemet. Joining me are my good friends, Rabbi Barry Chesler, Salman Shechter Day School of Long Island, Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanovsky, Anshe Chesed, New York City. We are recording this on Cholamoy Pesach. This is, today is day 202, 203 of the war we are thinking of the hostages uh, don't think that there's been a moment or a day or uh, without that, certainly since uh, Passover. And I know that many of us, all of us, you know, devoted some time, some thinking to the situation in Israel at our at our seders, our recent seders. And we're hoping that all the people that are joining us watching this had very, very meaningful Pesach celebrations, even in the situation that uh, we are experiencing as Kal Yisrael. Um and so here we are. We are we are moving in this calendar year towards Shabbat Cholamoid and towards Shvi Shal Pesach and the last day of Pesach. And we're going to take a look at a couple of things that uh, are part of this. Uh, it, it, this comes after uh, the the reading of Shir Shirim. I think we'll focus first on the reading for the seventh day, and then if we have time, we'll we'll do some Song of Songs which is traditionally uh, recited on the Shabbat of Chol Amoyed. But the seventh day of Pesach reading, uh, and it is the, it, it, it has as its centerpiece the, the Song of the Sea. And the reason for that is because traditionally it's on the seventh day of Pesach that um, the uh, Israelites are believed to have crossed the Red Sea. Am I getting that correct? Is that so far? So far. Wait, okay. what, do you, what do you mean believed? That's a historical fact. It's, they historical. Believe, it's no, not they, they believed to cross. They crossed the Red Sea on Shvi Shal Pesach. Okay, so so here we go. We're going to dive in this out. And so so on Shvi Shal Pesach, they got there. They got to the to the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, Yam Suf, and the Egyptians are chasing them, and it's it's terrifying for them, and. Moshe doesn't know what to do, he turns to God, he screams to God, and God says, what are you screaming at me? The barrel B'nai Israel, tell them to go. And they it's go. It's not the time to daven. Exactly. And Moses' descendants took that out of his words. There you go. There were thousands of years afterwards. It's not the time to daven. <laughs> so they, they get there, and we have... I, I want to kind of get into the scene where they they get through somehow during the night. They come to the other side. And I want to be that Israelite on the other side. And it says here in chapter 14, verses 30 and 31, by Yosha Adonai by Yomahu, this is the, the te a text that should be familiar to us from the daily prayers. God saved him on that them out that day. They saved God saved Israel from Egypt. Miad Mitzrayim, by Yarit Yisrael Mitzrayim, Met Asfatayam. Israel saw Egypt dead on the sides of the body of water on the sea. By Yar Yisrael that they had the Gdola. Israel saw the great arm, Asher Asadunai by Mitzrayim that God did in Egypt. By Yeruha Met Adunai. They feared God, and they had trust in God and in Moshe. And then, as Yashir Moshe, we get this jubilant exaltation, this poem and song uh, that is about the victory. I sing to God, for God has given me lift, right? Uh, his horse and chariot has he is thrown into the sea and so on the one hand I want to be that Israelite uh, that is uh, on the other side of the sea and is now in a chorus and yet I find it very difficult to, to not to believe but to to identify that the first instinct of that Israelite is going to be to, to stand in a chorus and to do like you know what kululam is you know have you ever seen the kululam so those are those, those are, are magnificent. 
They are magnificent, magnificent productions. Kulam, if uh, for our listeners or viewers who don't know, there's a movement in Israel of getting people, everybody, they get them into stadiums and arenas and, and you know all sorts of you know places, large events. They teach them a song in in not complicated four or three part harmony. It's it's I mean it's ecstatic, it's jubilant, it's exuberant. It, it, it's so wonderful. And let's just say so much has happened since 2019 when that was all the rage. It was like cool um, and they were gonna come to New York, and then there was COVID, and then there was the democracy movements, and then there's the war, and the the sort of the, the innocence and joyfulness and just beauty of those performances, which are all about hope and togetherness. They are the most life-affirming things in the world. They can feel a little hard to get in touch with right now, gotta say. Well, I know someone, I have someone in my shul who, who actually is in Israel now and went to one and, and like it's a bucket list thing. That's what, you know, she wanted to do this, this, you know, and and I would love to do this. I would love, you know, what, what a great thing to do to be with thousands of people and to sing your heart out, you know. There's a, an amazing video of Holocaust survivors oh. and their children and grandchildren you know, and and you see this, and it's just um, it's jubilant. I, I cannot, I cannot watch that without just with, with, with weeping, and, and, and that's sobbing. exactly it. You know, so Elliot, so why can't you imagine that same scene at the Sea of Reeds? I'll tell you why. Because I'm exhausted. I mean, if I'm if I'm if I'm in so, Israel, wait, 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 wait. I want to finish it. If I'm in Israel, no. I went through the whole night you know during getting my feet wet in the mud and getting to the other side i don't want to sing i want to just kind of can i sit for a second i have to disagree with you here i, I think that many of us have had the experience that as soon as the shofar is blown on yom kippur we're no longer hungry for a little while because we no longer have to fast now it's our choice and i think that once the Israelites realize, once they see that God has delivered them, they get an adrenaline rush and they burst into song. But what I would like to say also is that the Shira, and especially the way that you describe the moments leading up to it, is really a dramatic counterpoint to Dayenu and suggests how impoverished the a song Dayenu is because had they not gotten to the other side of the sea of reeds i venture to say that most of the israelites would have thought everything had been in vain they would not have said Dayenu. they needed to get to the other side and when they get there they have this double vision first they see the dead egyptians but they understand it as being god's saving power and I think that's a motivator and an energizer and leads them to burst into song. And it's an incredibly powerful song. It's an incredibly powerful song. And it may, it may in fact, convey all of the emotions that you're talking about. But but in the that mix of emotions, there is this idea, and it's a question that, that I think you've raised uh, previously, which is, is that moment an end or a beginning? And if it's an end, then okay, I, I think you know we can we can celebrate and we can cheer and sing. If it's a beginning, it's I'm I have trepidation. I'm I, there's I'm I'm nervous about this, and I'm also I, I again I want to go back to just pure pure raw, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual fatigue. I'm not sure that that. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, it's this is not like you know winning the Super Bowl, right? Or or is it? I don't know. I mean, are you know they're exhausted, they're jumping up for joy. I mean, is this is this what it is? This no, but I I think you know it's worth while thinking about what actually happened. Okay. So you wanted to imagine yourself as an Israelite going through the Sea of Reeds. So how wet are you? Yeah, really. Are you up to your ankles, to your knees. You know, one midrash is they were up to their necks. Yeah. So how wet are you? So I, I think my feet. It's dry land, okay. But how dry is the dry land? Don't know, okay. Uh, 
I'm I'm thinking I'm just projecting that I have a family and and I'm I'm watching everybody making sure that everybody is accounted for and it's it's and if you've ever just loaded up a car you know that's there's an enormous amount of of stress involved in that I mean imagine going you know several hundred, you know thousand meters you know doing this and and you're you it's dark and you're following thing and there's there's tons and tons okay. of people so, so the there's a Yehuda Amichai poem which is on this on the nose goes like this uh I, I just called it up on my computer Merachok kol davar nira nes aval mikaro gam nes lo nirakach from a distance everything looks like a miracle but up close even a miracle doesn't look like one afilu misha avar biyam suf bevekiat hayam ra'arak et hagav hemezia shal ha'olech lefanav viet noa yerechav hagdolot even someone who crossed the Red Sea at the splitting of the ocean saw only the sweaty back of the guy ahead of him and the motion of his fat thighs. Like, this is just such an awesome poem about the, the way these incredible, the poem goes on a little bit, but the, the uh, there's such an awesome poem about the disjunction between the story in the Torah, which is, Yes, there's suffering in the world, but the world is ultimately in order. We are rescued. We are on our journey to, to the promised land. By the way, the promised land is far away. You're going to walk into the desert. It's not easy. You got to walk out. You got to walk through the desert. But the the two things that you guys are saying at one level, Elliot's saying, you own, what do you see? You see the sweaty back of the fat guy in front of you. And Barry's saying, but you're, you're actually on your way to the promised land. Right. Okay, so you know what I, I want to go into the go into the the first verse. I, I, I'll I'll pose this for you. So I'm I'm going to try and solve my problem here, which is okay. I'm so exhausted, and I don't have I don't have the cheshek. I don't have the the energy to do this. But it says Az Yashir Moshe Uvenei Yisrael et Ashir Azot. So in when I live inside that verse for a second, all of a sudden I I do get the strength. Okay, and here's why. What, why I'll tell you why. And now I'll tell you after you're done. I'll tell you why. Because I'm with everybody. I get the strength from everybody. I I'm think... a social creature. One second. I'm a social creature. And this is the moment, the one moment, when I have whatever I have. I don't need food. I don't need water. I don't need the physical carbohydrate energy. I have my connection to the person in front of me. And I have total trust in my leader. I have total trust in God, and nothing else matters at this moment. And then I could sing. Okay, so I can okay. I can forget all the exhaustion. So I've I've gone to your place there. So I think what has happened, just in terms of the text, is that the last line is by Yaminu Baranayu Moshavdo. When they see this as the hand of God, they now trust Moses and God, or God and Moses, and. You know, it's interesting that you added completely trust, and Moses is the first one to sing if we parse the verse. As is your Moshe, and the, we understand the Vav not as a conjunction, but as sequential. Moses began to sing, and then the people joined him, and that's why they can sing, even though they're exhausted, because they're not singing on their own, they're singing with Moshe. Right, and so and so here is the deep the deep anguish here, which is that that in a moment when you when when the world is intact and you have a bond with your leader and and all of the structures around you who govern you and and have authority over you, that that's you can sing with that. And I think you know again, I don't want you know focus too much, but it's part of this, which is the crisis that we are going through is a crisis where there's no trust, there's no. The, the, you know the the structures of authority and the bonds that exist between the people a the you know call Yisrael the Jewish people Israel and a, a structure of authority around it those those bonds have been broken and that's that's very very painful but here in the text in the text we have a moment that's exuberant precisely because everybody's intact 
So Everybody. if we go with, I'm sorry, if we go with the image, then I think what makes this so great, and I have to say, Jeremy, parenthetically, that can't imagine Amichai's poem being said every day for during Shachrit. Yeah, okay. Um, right, the poetic <laughs> moment is in the Torah here, not in Amichai, as beautiful and important as the poem is. Um, I lost my train of thought. The 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 whole notion the problem of, with live podcasts because then that happens and then you say what was I going to say shoot yeah and it was so good <laughs> it was brilliant I know it was <laughs> we'll have to rewind it okay we'll go on then Ashira Ladunai ki gaoga asus vrakrama oziv zimrat yavaili shua this is my strength God is my strength and my salvation. Ze Eli Vanvehu. This is my God, and I will make him beautiful. I will I will make something anda I will make I will I will make a house. I'll make a a, a, a dwelling. Eloyavi Varomenu, God of my father, and I will exalt him. Okay, any any takers for that? Neve to, to make... verses. This is the source of our idea of Hidur Mitzvah. Yeah. Uh, I will this is my God and I will make make God's realm beautiful uh, I mean th this is rabbinic creativity it's not what the verse means but it's a good thing that we did with it is that you have to in your practice of Judaism not only just execute the bare minimum but try to make it beautiful right and of course there's also a generational thing going on his mind but my father also Elivehu Okay. Yeah. The, the Bible, the Bible's poetry tends to. This is their signature move. It's some sort of parallelism. It might be this, and also this even more. It might be this and the opposite of that. It might be two identical syn synonymous phrases. But here we have this affirmation, which could mean, you know, generational conflict. Ze'eli, I have to follow my God, and also there's this other one that I've inherited through the traditions which is like true for every Jew, right? Some sort of experience of your own relationship to this, this you know, your own spirituality, your own connection with the divine. And it comes mediated through Elohe Avi, your ancestral inheritance. Okay, so so I want to ask the question, which is which has been kind of gnawing at me and, and something that I want to be able to provide for my, my synagogue and to access texts and and a text like this and and say does this text reflect hope and in what way would you would you say that that something like this conveys a hope you know given that that here we are in a a a, a moment where as rachel goldberg poland says hope is mandatory i mean that that was a line that was quoted you know often at many many uh satyrs you know from things that were published all over hope is mad we have to hope in situations and and of course you know uh it, it, during this this whole experience we we're constantly navigating between you know the 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 sense of hope and maybe despair the sense of obligation um does the song itself tr trigger hope or does it does it stimulate hope or does it does it exercise the muscle of hope or, or should we look somewhere else for that? Is there anywhere else, you know, in the text or anywhere else, you know, given the okay, so take Song of Songs or take Spring or take Pesach itself or take anything? Where, where, where would you go for that? So, so I, I think that the prosaic moment here is that the song is the crystallization of hope in words. That when we are awestruck, we often lose our capacity for speech. But the song allows us to put our thoughts and feelings and emotions into words that can express the way we feel, but also teach us how we feel. Hmm. And there's a kind of, um, let's say, call it poetry in motion, where we go between the two poles, where the words express what we feel and teach us how we should feel as well. And I finally remembered what I wanted to say, <laughs> that what happens I, I think the image of going through the sea of reeds is that the israelites have secure footing that 
the image is that they're walking with confidence because it's on dry land. Our moment in 2024 in the midst of war is we've lost our footing and we're not quite balanced and we're still struggling to get to an equilibrium. All right, yeah. I, I want to I want to take this, and if 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 you guys and our listeners will forgive me, I'm going to go real JTS on you, which <laughs> is that, um, that that Shirat Hayam is actually a little bit of a mashup of a couple of different things, and it doesn't quite make sense. And, but I'm going to interpret this in a way, which I which I hope does respond to this question that you posed, Elliot, about. Whence the hope? You know, where do you find the hope? So, what do I mean by it's a mashup? Part of it is clearly about the Red Sea. You know, um, <clears throat> the blast of your nose, the nostrils, the waters piled up, and and the floods were a wall, and there was the depths of the heart of the sea, and the foe said, "I will, I will chase them down." But uh, you you blasted with your breath, and then and then the waters covered them over. And they sank like lead to the bottom of the ocean. All, all this is clearly about Shira Hayam. Then it's talked about something that hasn't happened yet. In your love, in your chesed, you you led them. And in your in the in your in your might, you led them to your holy abode. And the people heard, and the Philistines heard, and the and the Moabites heard, and the Canaanites were terrified, and and uh, all of those things that 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 made them. Tipolalehem ematav afachad bigdozurachai yidemu. They fell silent at your might, kaaven like a stone. Those things haven't happened yet. Tivi emu v'tita emu b'har nachalatecha. You bring them. I mean, you can say the it'll future tense, but. It describes reaching Bahar Nachalatecha, the the mountain of your inheritance, Machon Shiftacha Pa'alta Yade Pa'alta Adunai, a place for your dwelling place you have made God, Mikdash Adunai Konu Yadecha. Your hands have already made the sanctuary. We are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in Shirat Hayam before any of that happens. Mm -hmm. So what you have actually as a text. There's a little bit of a rough match mashup between a praise text for crossing the Red Sea into uncertainty, into the desert, into a long journey ahead of you, and one that's like from the dedication of the Beit HaMikdash, Solomon's time, or after that, uh, that says, okay, look at look at how this has already all come together. So what I want to say is that, and here's perhaps the the... I'm going to work a little hard to make the to squeeze the hope out of here, but as a Jew, you inherit not only the Bible text of what's happening to the Israelites, and they're going to walk through the desert, and that's going to that's going to be imposing, intimidating. They might not make it. Well, actually, you're inheriting as a Jew. You're saying this every morning in in, in worship, every single every single morning, and certainly on Passover. You're you're in, inheriting the whole story. You're inheriting the exile, and you're inheriting the homecoming, and you're inheriting the building, and you're inheriting the destruction. And to me, if you inherit all that stuff together, that that makes the whole piece bearable. That makes the whole piece worthwhile. So I'm going to inherit that the people are in the tunnels in Aza, and it's devastating. And I'm going to inherit that they were in the Shoah, in the camps. And I'm going to inherit that they came out. And that they, you know, like we, it's it's like in our own lifetimes, we've seen Shivat Zion. We've seen the return to the homeland. And and how can you, like, you got to inherit both parts of the song. And if you do, like, I had a conversion candidate who was actually a Barnard student, very distressed at everything that's going on in Columbia. And she said, like, what, what, what do I do? I said, we survived the Holocaust. We'll survive this. And I feel I feel like the the song, because it is a little bit rough and compound, helps us say, at one and the same time, you know, we we inherit we inherit the pain and we inherit the hope. Well, maybe maybe the message is just the song. Maybe it's the singing. Maybe it is cool a lot. Maybe it is the fact that 
that yeah we you know in in the synagogue we stand up we do sing it we 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 join in with this and and um uh, we for a moment lose ourselves in in melody and in the joy that that takes us in the emotional experience of this we're we're trying to you know get so much in our head and maybe we just have to you know listen to the fact that that at a, at a at, at some time, some point, you have to stop thinking so much and and just kind of feel it and feel feel exaltation and feel joy and feel a sense of deliverance and feel you know this hope and maybe maybe what we're saying and maybe what I'm learning from the two of you is that maybe it's through the act of singing that you you can create that sense of hope. Maybe that's what does it. And and if I were to 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 get up in front of saying you know you know do the intellectual poetic exercise of saying we are you know which which word is it what what song what's what verse is it no it's the whole experience of doing this it's Moshe of Israel it's Michamocha it's it's saying that together I can't I can't express what that feeling is but you know what it's a place where I'm free it's a place where I have joy it's a place where I can leap beyond myself and and sense that hope. Yeah, you know we we have the we have the idea of the resurrection of the dead, the physical resurrection of the dead. It's one of the it's one of the only dogmas that Jew is just supposed to believe in it. And the Talmud says, with if I may say, I think great humor, if you don't believe in it, you won't get it. <laughs> so if you believe in resurrection of the dead, you'll get it. And they. It, it isn't really in the Torah. It's alluded to in the, the idea, sort of alluded to in a passage in Daniel. It may be alluded to in, not exactly, but kind of in the book of Isaiah a little bit. But the rabbis always, you know, Minayin Tzchiat Hameti Mina Torah. Where is the resurrection of the dead found in the Torah? The truth is, it isn't, but they work hard to try to find it. And one of the examples of this is Az Yashir Moshe. Then Moses, not it's not that Moses sang, but Moses will sing and there's still a song there's still a song yet to be sung on you know then yet to be unlocked and that actually is a religious person that makes me feel great you know that there are songs yet to be sung that's like we got we got more celebration to have interesting so what gives the the singing power is the unity and community it comes when people are singing in harmony yeah. If you can imagine it being discordant, it would be unbearable. But great singing allows different voices to blend together and to become more than they are by themselves. Interesting. And what I wanted to say about Jeremy's comment about the compound structure of Azashir is that it comes as a reminder that we're on more than one journey at the same time. And some of our journeys are just beginning. Others have come to an end. And we find different way stations for different journeys, places where we could stop and refresh ourselves. And we don't always know. But I think that the, the hope comes from the idea that we will make the next step for as long as we can, and someone after us will continue the journey. Indeed. And so and so in this moment, they they get to the other side, they do sing their song. And they get up the next morning, and then of course they have you know all sorts of challenges coming uh, on the way, with challenges with water and food. First and challenges: what are they going to have for breakfast? Exactly, exactly. But but um, they got there. They got to the end, and they got to a new beginning. It's a it is a gateway. This is um, a remarkable, remarkable moment. It's um, it's a miracle that that they got there, um, and I guess that itself is a source of hope that that we can close our eyes, imagine ourselves in whatever condition we are in, and uh, understand, as, as, as I was trying to express the fatigue, maybe I was personifying the fatigue of, you know, two satyrs and all that, uh, but, but there's the, the joy in being able to kind of get up and to sing and to be there and to not have to think through everything and just to experience that that we made it we made it that's that's what they're saying we made it and this is a very powerful powerful moment um we didn't get much into shira shirim but but and that is you know recited on uh on shabbat cholamoid it's all about hope and the promise of renewal and spring and it's a 
היו בער, נראו בארץ, עת אז אביר הגיע וכל התור נשמע בארצנו, it's all about things that are beginning to flower, the budding and, and the promise, the promise that there is a future and looking at, at the, the season and seeing that there is, a, there is the possibilities of all sorts of things coming, that at this time of the year, everything is, is, is being sorted out for the future in, in terms of... You know, I, I, like, I, like, I like that you use the word promise. Shirashim is just spectacular. It's such rich poetry. It's sexy and, and full of life in, in every great way. But the two characters, there's, a, there's lots of nature description, there's lots of affirmation about what love is all about, uh, such that it, among other things, gives rise to, um, to the rich Midrashic tradition in Judaism and in Christianity, allegorizing this as the relationship of God to the world or God to the covenantal people or God to the soul or uh, you know all the above. But the two characters, to the extent that there's a plot, there's a male voice and a female voice, and they uh, they look for each other, but they never quite find each other. They're always, here comes my love, he's skipping over the hills. I look for him, I cannot find him. Uh, she actually gets, the female voice gets assaulted by the town watchman. It's a little bit, it's not, it's not, it's not terribly graphic, we don't know exactly you know, what happens to her, although it's suggestive, whether she gets, you know, raped, or she just gets bonked on the head, or whatever it is, um, the, uh, the the thing is that Song of Songs is a song about promise, not a rival. It's about the possibility unrealized yet. Um, and so that's, I think, what gives it some of its spiritual, spiritual, like, usefulness, and 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 how meaningful it is, because that's what it is to be spiritual. You have hints of the wonderfulness and you experience wonderfulness, but not all the time. And sometimes it's the search that you know you have to you have to you know keep 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 pursuing that search. You have to live in that. I think I think we we're living in a well of hope and we have to kind of um draw from that, draw from that all the time. I think that that's part of the, the dynamic of, of life and I think specifically of Jewish life. It's always to live with that sense that you can you can draw and draw from that and the you know you can you can read almost every text and ask this question, where is the hope in this? I could see it in the in in, uh, in the buds of, of spring. I could see it at the sea. I could see it from Lech Lecha and I could see it uh, all the way to the Hallel that we're we're signing on. On Passover, there's there's hope everywhere for us, and there's hope for our people, and that's what the message we want to give everybody as Pesach ends and as our time together ends. Uh, we want to leave with a message of hope that um, that good and better days are coming for us, that we will get through our crises and our challenges as we experience them now, and that we will be able to. Uh, rejoice, sing, sing together, be together, and give uh, all sorts of expression to our gratitude, especially to everyone for watching and listening to us over this time and all of our previous uh, times together. We thank you for watching. We thank you for listening. And we look forward to seeing you in the next edition. In the meantime, everyone, Chag Sameach. Chag, Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. And we'll see you on the next edition of Parsha Talk. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.